I followed the Colombian conflict and peace, attempts at peacemaking over many years. So I'm uh, crossing my fingers and I think like many people around the world, really hoping and being optimistic about the progress that's been made so far. It is an extraordinary process. It has been far more inclusive um, of issues and of women and um, gender dimensions uh, than we've seen in many places. So I think from that perspective, it's great. And it didn't start like that. It, it, I think what we're seeing in terms of, say, victims' issues or land or any of the aspects that, that have now integrated um, the questions of women's um, rights and, and women's participation, it's because of women's activism. It's because of the many years of women lobbying and advocating and be, being a strong voice for peace in Colombia. Compared to other countries and other peace processes, uh, what we know is that when civil society is included in a process, the chances of uh, the peace being sustainable increases by 54%. When women are included in an effective way, they never have a negative um, role. When, when the women's voices come in as a collective, it's always positive. So these are things I think that we have to bear in mind in Colombia and, and con the Colombian process should recognize this incredible social capital. There are many examples that we can draw on from South Africa that where women really led, were involved and they led the process and ended up being very strong voices in parliament um, to right now in Syria where there's an attempt at bringing vo women's voices into the process, Libya where women were at the table and, and they're still struggling. But Colombia has, is, is steps ahead. And so it would be wonderful to see the, the potential realized in a way that others can learn uh, from them and, and become the new role model globally. When you have women involved in the peace process, and, and I really uh, want to emphasize women peace builders, women who have really been committed to peace and nonviolence, they bring a perspective of what communities need. They bring a human voice and a human experience. And I think that's really important because sometimes um, when it becomes political and when it becomes about military and military officials and politicians, they lose track of the human cost. And the human cost is on both sides because when you have war, it doesn't matter whether you're a state or a non-state. When you use violence, you invariably affect civilians and ordinary people. So that human voice and human face of conflict needs to be brought in and women bring that. They don't just bring it for themselves. They bring it, they will talk about men, they'll talk about the elderly, they'll talk about children. They are unique in how they address these things. Um, they also are very pragmatic. Sometimes people think that women are idealistic. But women peace builders that I've met around the world are very, very practical about the day-to-day -day issues, about the need for uh, good policing, for example, or good economic programs that are for the betterment of society as a whole. Um, they're not idealistic in the sense of expecting 100% the best of everything. They want, they believe in process and they work slowly to, to get there. When we bring them to the table, they really do articulate what we mean by a culture of peace because the technical aspects, the political solutions, the military solutions are necessary, but they're not enough. When you have conflict in your country, you, you have to have a societal process and we have to learn how to live together and have empathy and um, celebrate each other's diversity. So these are the things that, that women often bring because that's the life and, and that's what they've been doing at the community level as well. I think the main challenges of the process are, in, like in every other process, that there will always be people who are against the process. There are always vested interests who benefit more from war than from peace. But uh, we need to recognize that when peace comes, more people benefit from peace, whether you're in the business community, whether you're in politics, it doesn't matter. 
it benefits much, many more people than, than the war does. So, but the people who have vested interest will always be uh, a problem and they will emerge and often they emerge right after the peace agreement is signed. So that's one big concern and, and it's something that we should be aware of and we should be prepared for um, to push them back because they're a minority and a minority should not drive the future of the majority. So that, that I think is one thing. The second thing is that the international community will be present and they will be supportive of the process and chances are that there will be resources and money coming through but it's important that the resources are also reaching civil society. Um, we need the government to be able to be strong and to be able to address the needs of people but in the transition period when the government is still having its own process of transition and doesn't have the capacity to reach communities may not be trusted in certain communities and so forth where civil society is present and has been active they need the resources to continue otherwise if we leave a vacuum and we don't support those organizations then they will be filled by negative forces and so the balance between government and civil society and the collaboration i think is, is a really essential piece of the moving forward Thank you.